So hello everyone, my name is Amra and I would like to wish you a warm welcome to Comparative Agility Meetup. I'm excited to, now, to announce our today's speaker, Rob Meyers, the founder and principal instructor, instructor and coach at Agile Institute. Uh, Rob has 36 years of professional experience in software development roles and has been training and coaching organizations in agile engineering practices for the last 25 years. He works with teams to encourage and strengthen their agile skills and practices and to help organizations customize and improve their software development methods. After Rob's presentation, we are going to leave some time for Q&A, so feel free to write down your questions in the chat or you can speak uh, after the presentation. Also, we are going to record this session and we are going to publish it on our YouTube channel. I will provide the link. Uh, in the comments on Meetup. So without further ado, Rob, stage is yours. Thank you, thank you. And I have a quick question for you, um, just to make sure we've got an hour. Yes, we have an hour including... and we can leave, we can leave a couple more minutes for Q&A. Okay, okay, yeah, no worries. Um, I don't know if I have a full hour of- uh, That's fine, don't worry about it. Storytelling to do, so that, that works out perfect. All right, Perfect. and uh, if anyone wants to, feel free to go ahead and show yourself on camera. Um, it would, it would. It's just nice for me to see a face or two uh, from the from the audience. It, not required, though. Um, otherwise, I'll just feel like I'm just talking to myself here, right? So, the topic: how and when essential developer capabilities truly pay dividends. Um, might sound like a big hurdle, but uh, a lot of this is going to be from my own first person experience. So I'm not going to share a whole lot of uh, uh, academic data or anything like that. So, um, but interestingly enough, I do have a, a lot of uh, experience and a lot of it was a surprise to me. So without further ado, uh, first of all, I, I said that I would, uh, uh, talk about the uh, the three different levels of uh, of value that come from uh, engineering practices, but I should probably start with what they are and why we do them. So most of you are probably familiar with uh, one of the agile uh, processes, if you want to call them that, or frameworks. One of the agile methods, uh, particularly Scrum. Scrum is probably the most popular. And what I've found over the years is that a lot of Scrum teams really start to struggle. A lot of Agile teams in general really start to struggle five or six sprints or iterations into uh, what they're doing, even on a greenfield project. And it can be a mild struggle at first, but it seems to build up over time. What happens is you know, you're 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 asked to build your software in increments and iteratively. And uh, when you first start out, that's really, you know, I mean, if you're a software developer, you'd know that's that's pretty easy. That's a lot of fun. You're building new stuff. This is great. Um, and the testers are okay with that because hey, you know, we we just test what you built this uh, this sprint. That's that's fine. Five or six sprints into it, uh, we start to feel a little bit of mm, momentum or inertia really on pushback. And what's happening is that, you know, you're being asked to build new features on top of old software. And uh, as software developers know, this is, this is really risky because every time you're touching a piece of software, if you're adding something new, you know, we talk about thin slices, right? Yeah, we're building thin slices here. I should probably go the other way, right? I, don't, I can't remember. Yeah, that's that's it. thin slices through time. Well, software isn't built like that. Software really is built more like, you know, you, you start this way and then you kind of cross cut because the most important parts of your system are usually the parts that are changing the most frequently. Think about, for example, the database schema. Database schemas change weekly, especially at the beginning of a project. And those are right at the core of your system. So, so it becomes, and, and software developers don't want to break the code. They're not intending to damage the product. They really want to build good stuff. So they get more and more careful. 
And even if they are the most careful, they still break things. And then the testers are in the same sort of situation because not only do they have to test what you just built, they have to test what you built from the beginning of time, essentially. The entire product should really be tested because of that interaction between the software uh, pieces that are being built. So, so I call this the Agilist's dilemma, which is the very thing that we know is, is better than doing you know, all of this planning and, and design and building up front and then testing if there's time left over at the end. Uh, we're doing things iteratively and incrementally, but, but that comes with its own costs. So what do we do about that? Okay. So, so the, the, I'll, I'll go ahead and share the, uh, the image real quick here. Now, if you're familiar with extreme programming, you know that it, it specified about, originally specified about 12 practices that lasted about a month. And then there were 13 practices and, and, you know, it's, and then you make up your own practices and that sort of thing. But uh, other than the things that were very similar to what Scrum suggests, um, what I found is that these four practices are the engineering practices or the software development practices that really help in these areas. Okay, so, so if you're not familiar with these uh, test-driven development or behavior-driven development, essentially some sort of test-first practice where you write a test then you write the code that makes it pass, and then you do a little refactoring, and you'll see refactoring is there too. Uh, continuous integration, and then some kind of continuous collaboration practice where you're actually working together. You're not working alone in a in a uh, a cube someplace. Okay, you're actually interacting with somebody else. Both of you working towards building something, getting something to work. And then refactoring, uh, and you'll see, uh, I'll talk about why I have it in the center uh, later on, but uh, refactoring this practice of changing the design without changing the behavior of the system. Okay. So those are the three, the four. Okay, so the, th the three levels of value that you get from doing these long-term one of them is fairly common, uh, especially when we're talking about test-driven development. We've noticed that using test-driven development, we greatly reduce the number of defects very rapidly. Uh, I would say that uh, some of the teams that have, have learned test-driven development from me, or some of the teams that I worked on who adopted test-driven development, experience a reduction in the number of defects found uh, within a month which is pretty amazing. And when I talk to people about uh, people that I've coached, they often suggest that the, the next release that they did was the best release since the beginning of the product. So they've never released before without creating more, uh, a lot more defects than what they, what they had in this particular release. So, so the releases almost immediately become higher quality. And so I call that the first level of uh, uh, value that you're getting out of these practices. You're reducing the defects, you're reducing rework, okay? And then the second level, when you've been doing this for, oh, say, uh, maybe four to six months, what you'll find is, and it'll probably happen earlier than that, but you'll notice four to six months into it, is that you're not slowing down with those new features. And uh, most teams, most software developers have experienced that slowdown, so they know. Uh, but they'll find that, oh, hey, look, you know, this, this particular feature is no more difficult than it was before, right? Uh, there's, there's often a, you know, how, a, a way of estimating where you say, okay, so if we were starting Greenfield, how long would it take us to build this? And of course, you can shuffle around your, your uh, uh, user stories or your PBIs, whatever you want to call them. You can shuffle them around. But if you estimate it as though it were Greenfield, what would that be? What's interesting is that, that that's, you know, that's the, the Agilist dilemma creates, as, as you go, the estimate for that particular user story gets greater and greater and greater. 
unless you're doing these practices, and then it stays approximately the same. It takes the same amount of time to build it, you know, two years from now as it would to build it greenfield. That's pretty amazing. Okay, so that's the second level. So, so these probably make a lot of sense to you, and and maybe some of you have experienced these things. One of the things that uh, I found to be uh, much more surprising are what I call the black swan user stories. Now, if you're not familiar with the term black swan, I'm, I'm taking it from uh, Anti-Fragile or the book called Black Swan, which is uh, from Nicholas uh, Taleb. Is that how we decided we were pronouncing it? <laughs> I might be wrong about that. Uh, that's how the it? internet. What's that? Taleb. I think that's how you said it. Okay. Nicholas Taleb. Okay, so he wrote uh, the the book Black Swans, and he wrote the book uh, Anti Fragile, um, and and the idea there being that uh, apparently in Europe at one time the term comes from the notion that uh, a black swan is very rare; you don't see them very often. They're very special. Uh, this turned out not to be true once we got to Australia. I guess uh, there, there there's a lot of them. But still, the the terminology sticks. So it's something extremely rare. And what Taleb was saying, Taleb Taleb was saying, was they're they're not only rare; they're very disruptive to the system. So they're um, kind of a, an, a a huge impact. For example, some of the some of the negative examples would be the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. Very much a a black swan event. Um, the, uh, the triple disaster in Fukushima, you know, that was a huge black swan event for them. Now in the black swan events don't necessarily have to be negatively impactful. They can be positively impactful too. But the notion here is that you can never predict when they're going to arrive. You don't know what they are until they arrive. They're a surprise. And in software, what I find is that when, when these things come up, what they're, what's happening is perhaps the product owner or a customer, somebody asks for something just way out there. And, um, and they can be quite valuable. If we could turn it around, if we could get it done, this might actually really benefit us. So they can be very valuable. They can also be very costly. Oftentimes, you know, if, if a team hasn't been doing the right practices, it's, it's, it's dismissed. It's, well, we can't build that. You know, it'll, that would take six months of rework to rebuild. So that's essentially what a Black Swan user story is. I call them Black Swan user stories. So, so um, and uh, I've encountered quite a few. So let me tell you a story. This is the first one. So I'm going along and I, I've joined this team uh, in 2001. I joined a team that was led by James Shore. You may have heard of him. He's the author of Art of Agile Development. And um, his team had been doing extreme programming practices for about a year. So I show up and I'm working with them and pretty impressed by the quality of the code and what they've been doing. And so, um, happy to join the team and we're working along and what we would do is we were in portland at the time he and i and a few others were in portland and half of their team more than half of their team was in utah so uh every two weeks we would fly out to utah for the planning and um one day during the planning maybe probably not that long into the into the project maybe you know six weeks into the project we fly out there and uh, things are going along as normal. And then uh, the customer, product owner, whatever, however you want to refer to her, she comes into the meeting and she says, I have a request for you and you're probably not going to like it because I, I promised you that long ago that uh, with these servlets that you've been building, we're only going to internationalize for um, Latin American character sets. In other words, you know, Espanol and uh, French and English, basically, you know, the North American languages that are most common. And uh, internationalizing for those is really fairly straightforward because, you know, at the time, the, the technology, if you were uh, using a Latin American character set and you said that you spoke Spanish, you could load up the page, the static page. Um, 
and uh, you know it would it would just pick the page that you wanted to see in the folders. And then the other thing was if you typed things in Latin American character set, that was all one big, you know, well-known character set. So she says, well, but now we have uh, clients in Japan who are complaining because uh, they type in their information and when they get it back out again, it's all a mess. It's just box, 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 box. So, so what the servlet did, what, the one servlet that I'm thinking of most primarily was, was like an early version of SurveyMonkey. You could create surveys, you, you gave it questions, you gave it potential answers, multiple choice kind of answers. And, uh, and of course, the Japanese clients wanted it in Japanese. They didn't want to have to type in English. So uh, this was the story, you know, to support the Japanese clients by allowing them to type in their own language into the questions and answers and have them deploy these surveys. And I had just come off of, uh, you know, the, one of those dot bomb projects where, you know, everybody tries to build everything all at once and make it uh, available to a million users simultaneously, and then nobody ever actually uses it. Um, and the company goes bankrupt. So I was like, and I was used to uh, Java uh, JSP pages and, and technology like that, which didn't help a darn bit. So I'm thinking, what did I get myself into? <laughs> This is terrible. You know, I just show up and now I've got to re-internationalize. You know, this is a major architectural change. That was my thought, major architectural change. So Jim Shore, he, uh, he, he gets on his laptop. He's like, give us a minute. We'll do an estimate. And what usually happened at these meetings, it was great because she would present her stories and then she'd go get us lunch while we did estimation, last minute estimation. So, so she goes off and, uh, and uh, nicely gets us lunch. And Jim gets on his laptop. He's like, just, just give me a minute. And I'm trying to look over his shoulder, like, what is he doing? And he knows his code inside and out, right? And he can also type way faster than most software developers. So he's, and uh, he goes, okay. And I'm like, okay, what, right? Customer comes back. We give an estimate. Jim says, we can have it for you in three days. I'm like, what? You've got to be kidding. This is a major, major architectural change. We're not talking about one servlet. We're talking about like four or five different servlets, um, just hundreds of different pages. And we're talking about internationalizing all of those, allowing for international input and output. And I'm just thinking to myself, this guy's crazy, right? Three days. <laughs> like, Jim, you're crazy. Three days. Uh, don't worry about it, Rob. It's just an estimate. Um, at the time we were estimating in what we called ideal days. So we weren't using gummy bears or story points or anything like that. It was ideal days. An ideal day, what, the idea behind an ideal day was, uh, if you were left alone without meetings and without weird interruptions and all that kind of stuff, and you were just working, 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 you could get it done in basically three days. So, so roughly he was saying three days and, you know, we had a two week sprint, so if we could get it done in the sprint, that'd be great. But, you know, I was, I was still like major architectural change. So, so I, I mentioned that we had the, the, um, the teams were split and the teams got to decide the separate two separate parts of the team got to decide which stories they would do. And, and, uh, unfortunately for me, Jim took the, the internationalization story for, for us, for he and I, and, and our group which the other part of the team was very happy because they didn't want to touch it because they knew better, right? So so we take it uh, back to Portland with us and we did it in three days. In fact, we spent two and a half of those three days doing research, trying to figure out, so this is 2001, this isn't 2023, okay? 2001, this is over 20 years ago. If you if you can think back to the technology in those days, it was it was not where it is today, and um, we so the first thing we did was we were like, well, has anybody else actually done this? So we go to all these sites and we're typing in kanji characters into their like registration page, you know, my name is whatever, and it would come back and say, welcome to our site, you know, box 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 box. Uh, 
and, and everybody was doing it. Microsoft did this. Everybody was doing it except for Babelfish, of course, which eventually became something. They're still around. I, don't, I can't remember the other name for them, but they were a translation site. So, of course. So we knew it was possible. And then we said, okay, so, and, and really all it is is just the text. It's not like you have to actually understand what's being said. You just record it and play it back. So it just has to show up clearly, right? You just have to handle the, the, um, the Unicode character, basically. So we were handling UTF-8. We needed to be handling Unicode. So that was basically what we were doing, UTF-8 to Unicode. So we said, okay, so, and we were using Java. So we said, okay, is it possible in Java? Has anybody done it in Java? And we're looking at all those, you know, whatever, uh, um, uh, you know, those code repository things and, and all that, uh, what are they, slash dot and all that. And we're trying to find out if anybody has ever done this, if anybody has any sample code, nothing. So we dig on into the, um, the huge book that was the, uh, uh, what's the Java certification, Java developer certification? Yeah, that was, I think that's what it was called, right? It's a book about this thick. We're, we're looking through every detail of Java and we figured it out. Um, and it turned out to be about 10 lines of code. Just 10 lines of code. Um, if you if you told somebody that you wrote 10 lines of code in three days, they would kind of look at you funny, like, boy, you are really, really slow. But 10 lines of code, two methods. And um, and I, I was just I was astounded. I was like, wow, this is great. When we got it together, it was it was like, well, duh. But at the same time, it was just astounding that that we actually managed to get it done. And um we were lucky. We, we, we got it done in three days. It took a, a weekend to actually get it to deploy because what you had to do with uh, the Oracle database was you had to basically back it up, completely back it up, shut it down, flip a switch that says, I'm using Unicode for my characters instead of UTF-8, bring it back up and reload from the backup, and then it would all just work. It all just worked. It was amazing. So the black swan arrived successful great we opened up you know japan uh technically a lot of other countries as well um and uh it was just a, a big win for that for that organization at the time um and i remember thinking too after that wow that was a once in a career opportunity that really showed how these great practices these extreme programming practices really worked but you know is that ever going to happen to anybody ever again well i didn't think so but um after that i would have to say that like i say about once every six months in my career and i worked with about six different teams over six different years um and every team that embraced these practices would run into that and a lot of teams that didn't embrace the practices would run into it and they would go, you know, hey, that's nice, but there's, you know, there's no way that we can actually implement that. So it's got the cost of delay right there. If you, you've got a lot of cost of delay in these practices, if you don't do them and you don't start by doing them and you don't start now, then six months from now, you're not going to be in a position to handle that, that event. Um, the, the, the one that, that comes to mind very quickly uh, which was fun because I was the coach on it, um, was the next year in 2002, working on a team that was essentially, they were, they were rewriting this, uh, or what's called the organ transplant information system from the university of Michigan and very, you know, life critical sort of, uh, data going on there. And, uh, uh, they were very rigorous about how they were having it built, and we were using extreme programming practices to build it. And uh, it was it was essentially a rewrite of an old Fox Pro, Fox Base sort of. Uh, I think it had a web interface, but maybe not. I don't remember. But we built it on a web interface. We built it in Java, um, and. Uh, we were just rebuilding what was already there. It was Otis one and we were turning it into Otis two. And uh, 
what we would do is we would we would print these reports and they had to be printed and they had to be taken by the surgeons back home with them every day so that if there was a huge you know blizzard power outage disaster that kind of thing and they found themselves having to go into the hospital to do surgery they would have this list of potential recipients so it was very it was it was it was ranked it, these they were really important reports and so what they would do is they would print out these reports and uh, it, again you have to sort of imagine going back in time to 2002 what the web was like and what printing something off of the web page was like it would print if you had a laser printer, it would print on two different sheets. Every screen came out in two different sheets. It would print, you know, everything from the left side of the screen, and then it would print this small part of the right side of the screen onto a different page. It was really ugly. And so what they had was they would have interns, literal interns and nurses, uh, or, you know, just uh, 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 medical records clerks. I was one of those once, so I remember this. Uh, they'd take the printouts and staple them together or tape them together and fold them so that they would fit into the medical records. So the surgeons got a little bit frustrated with this after a while. And they said, could we just have, you know, one small change on every single one of our reports? Could you just put a little button at the top that says print me in PDF? And of course, you know, somebody on the team is like, that's pretty much a major architectural change. We've architected this whole thing so that it emits HTML and you want an eight, a, a printed this in PDF button, a dynamic print this in PDF button. And I'm like, ah, three days. <laughs> so I got to be the one who, you know, was removing hands from my throat. No, no, it's okay. It's just an estimate. We did it in three days. I think we actually, that one we did yeah, we pretty much did it in uh, in uh, two days, and then had found you know did a lot of uh, uh, exploratory testing on the the end product and found a little some details like uh, the formatting. Sometimes the formatting you know the the text would be right up against the edges, and you'd have to um, and of course using test driven development we would we would test that it was no, it's not like that. It's like this. Uh, and it's all text-based and all that kind of stuff. So it was really not not all that painful. Um, but uh, yeah, it it, uh, it the reason why, if you're if you're technical, the reason why that this worked was because effectively, it was very interesting because HTML, as you might know, is sort of um, uh, it's sort of, row based i guess is the best way to describe it so there's rows with cells and that's how you build up a, a a table and we were using tables i know very sad but this was 2002 and um pd and and the the reports that they were using were very much sort of from a from a customer standpoint from a business standpoint were column based they wanted you know this set of data in these columns and this set of data in these columns and this set of data in these columns. And so we would take these, these, uh, uh, the data kind of from columns and reformat it into rows and print it out as rows. And then it turns out that PDF was column based. So what we did was we sort of, you know, broke off, uh, and, uh, what we called an HTML emitter. And then we gave it an abstraction, you know, emitter. And then we created using test-driven development a PDF emitter, and then probably just like on the URL there was you know what what format format equals PDF, and that would pick the emitter, and then it would just generate in that respect, and and uh, it, it all just it it was just a lot of fun. But okay, so now now that I'm at I'm at about half time. Here's the, here's why here's why. The black swan stuff actually worked um so we especially on the first one when uh when jim and i uh built that uh or or replaced the uh what what i guess i almost gave it away so so we looked into what how it was that we were actually able to do that in three days and the reason why was because all of the the user input and all of the user output was going through 
two sets of uh, uh, methods. It was very condensed. It was very isolated. It wasn't all over on you know, 18 different pages. It was all going through one particular thing. And it wasn't necessarily any specific reason, except that we didn't like duplication. So that's what refactoring gives you. Refactoring gives you the ability to reshape the design without changing the behavior. And the behavior is locked in by this safety net of tests that you've built using test-driven development, right? So you start with the tests and, and then you're building the software and that actually leaves the software soft because the tests are the rigorous definition of what this software does. And the software in the middle is how it does it. Okay, so we change the how without changing the what, right? That's essentially refactoring. And because we were refactoring diligently without really knowing exactly, I mean, we always had a reason. I, I think the reason for uh, refactoring that code had something to do with, uh, well, it might've had to do with security. Like we, we wanted to make sure that nobody was doing uh, SQL injection or, or cross-site scripting or something like that. So we had some black hat tests that were, and because, because we had all those pages, we kind of reduced down the input and output to one location. But uh, uh, that refactoring just sort of happened naturally. And so when it came time to make the changes, we made the changes in one place or two places, right? The input place and the output place. Uh, we couldn't have predicted that that's what was going to happen. That's the nature of these stories. We couldn't have predicted that our refactoring would pay off, right? So you can't decide up front. This is the other thing about black swans. You can't prepare for them. It's impossible to prepare for them specifically. You can only prepare for the possibility. You can only prepare your system so that it's more resilient, right? And, and Taleb actually had this notion of anti-fragile, which is resiliency is, you know, the asteroid hits your system and then your system recovers. To the, back to the same, or, or approximately the same state. They're the same amount of goodness, right? Um, an anti-fragile system is a system that receives the impact and then becomes better. It becomes even stronger. And I like to say that in a way, that's what these black swan events or black swan user stories do to your system, your product, is they force you to refactor to the point where you, you have the flexibility to refactor further. And that gives you the ability to receive more input, more uh, interesting user stories in the future. So, you know, don't do them and receive lots of boring stories and do this all boring stuff. And then when something interesting comes through, throw it out the window and say, too bad, you know, or do the work up front, do the work continuously. And I keep saying up front and you're like, well, yeah, I've got, you know, I remember one, uh, one, I, I used to teach this course, test driven development course in, uh, at Microsoft. And I recall one time after the course, one of the Microsoft employees came up to me and said, this was just awesome. I really love this. I, I'm really looking forward to doing this at my next job. I'm like, what? Why not? Why not this? Why not here? Why not? Why not Microsoft? He says, well, we have uh, four, what was it? 400,000 lines of uh, untested C sharp code to manage which was just a, you know, it was like a, a knife in my heart. I'm like, you know, test-driven development predates .NET. And, and actually, .NET had a unit testing framework very early on. So the notion that there are 400,000 lines of untested C-sharp code somewhere in Microsoft's, one of Microsoft's products, I don't remember which one it was, just devastating to me. I'm like, ah, oh, that is just, that's so hurt. So I started talking about, um, and I added to that, that particular course, um, the notion of what's called legacy characterization testing, which is, you know, I, I described test-driven development as creating a safety net. Well, if you think about uh, any untested code or legacy code that's in within that, your system, you can think about it as it, it doesn't have part of the safety net. Part of the safety net has a gap, it has a hole in it. So you need to patch it. So legacy characterization testing is creating uh, the tests for the code, for the behavior that already exists. You're creating the tests around that to protect that 
while it, before you change it. So you don't have to do that to the whole system. You don't have to spend six months creating uh, a safety net before you can move forward. You just decide every day. You go, hey, I'm, I have to change this line of code right here. Does it have tests? No. Okay, I'm going to create legacy characterization tests around it. Then what, before I change it, what am I going to do? I'm going to write a new unit test. Okay, so there's a process. And the process continuously uh, locks in the behavior that you're creating and locks in the existing behavior and increases the size of the safety net. So it just keeps getting better and better and better. Okay. And um, in fact, one of the one of the teams that I, I mentioned earlier that that sometimes teams report back to me and they say that their next release was really high quality. One of those teams, they spent most of the next six months actually, you know, building software that way. If it didn't have tests, they'd add characterization tests, and then they would add, uh, uh, they do TDD to create the new behaviors. And they were the ones who reported that, you know, the, their defect count went from, it went down about 80%, I think. Just incredible progress in six months. So... It's unfortunate that a lot of teams that are already in flight have to spend a lot of time doing this, but but legacy characterization testing isn't really as painful as it sounds. It's not it's not boring. It's kind of like software uh, paleontology. It's it's digging for the behavior that already exists and uh, and protecting it and covering it with you know with a nice protective coding of of unit tests or actually they're not really good unit tests they're more like characterization tests can test more than one behavior at a time in fact it's it's kind of like you optimize for your own time uh, when you're doing characterization testing and michael feather's book working effectively with legacy code is the book on legacy characterization testing so there you go you have a book recommendation <laughs>